So hello and welcome to the first lecture on chapter 13, dealing with gases and gas laws. Well, it said when we were talking about the three phases of matter, that a gas occupies all the volume you make available to it. That is, it spreads out. It takes on both the volume and shape of its container. So anytime you're talking about a sample of gas, you have to have it confined. You have to have it trapped. And so automatically, when you are talking about gases, you end up having to talk about whatever volume they occupy. The second thing you have to worry about with a gas is pressure. If you have a balloon and it's full of gas, how do you know that the balloon is full of gas if the balloon's opaque? You can't see the gas. And the answer, of course, is it's because the balloon is inflated. It has volume occupied by the gas. Well, that makes the question, why is the balloon expanded? It's because the gas exerts pressure. It is pushing out on the surface, on the inside surface of the balloon, trying to make it larger. And this is another characteristic of a gas. A gas exerts pressure. That is, it pushes on every surface it's in contact with constantly. The gas is exerting pressure on every surface available. And so we have to talk about pressure a little bit. If I have a liquid in a beaker sitting on the countertop, it will be perfectly happy to sit there. And what would happen if I took a long tube of glass, opened at both ends, and stuck it into that liquid? Where would the liquid end up inside that tube of glass? And basically, of course, it's going to end up right at the same level as all the rest of the liquid in the beaker. This is, of course, because gravity wants all the liquid to be at the lowest level possible. So if the level in the tube was either higher or lower than the level of the liquid outside the tube, it would very quickly reach the same level. It would flow until the level inside and outside was the same. That would be fine. In example two, suppose we had the tube closed at one end before we stuck it into the liquid. Where would the liquid end up in the tube now? And the answer is basically it wouldn't. It would end up, the level of the liquid in the tube would be right at the bottom of the tube rather than where the rest of the liquid was in the beaker. And why? Because the tube, of course, was full of gas. And so the tube was already occupied. And so the liquid could not go into the tube because the tube already had the gas in it. And so it would end up right at the bottom. Which brings us to case three. Suppose we had the tube absolutely full of liquid and open at both ends. What would happen now when we stuck it into the beaker? Well, what happened now would be simple and straightforward. The liquid would all run out of the tube until the level in the tube was the same as the rest of the beaker, the same as in case one, because gravity wants all the liquid to be at the same level. And so there's nothing to stop the liquid from all running down into the beaker and ending up at the same level. And finally, we do the fourth case. In the fourth case, we seal the top end of the tube and fill it with liquid. And now stick it up into our beaker. And what's going to happen? Well, gravity still wants the liquid to all run out of the tube. And if you did this on the moon, that's, in fact, what would happen. All the liquid would run out of the tube, and you'd end up with the same level inside and outside the tube. That's not what happens if you go and do this in the laboratory. That doesn't happen on Earth. And the question is, why not? Well, there's one very significant difference between the Earth and the moon. And no, the moon has gravity. That's not a difference between the Earth and the moon. The moon has less gravity, but yes, it still has gravity. It still wants the liquid all to run out. But what the Earth has that the moon does not have 
is an atmosphere. And an atmosphere is made out of gas. And what does a gas do? A gas exerts force on every surface it's in contact with. It pushes against that surface. And so the atmosphere of the Earth is pushing down on the liquid in the beaker. And that has significance. Because as the liquid flows out of the column, the level of liquid in beaker, the beaker will go up. But the atmosphere doesn't want the level of the liquid in the beaker to go up. It's pushing down. So the atmosphere is trying to shove the liquid into the tube, because it doesn't care what's going on in the tube since the tube sealed. So the atmosphere is shoving down on the top of the liquid. And so we have two competing forces. Gravity wants all the liquid to run out of the tube, the atmosphere wants to shove all the liquid into the tube. And so what is going to happen? Well, the force of the atmosphere is basically constant. It's just pushing down on the surface with whatever force it has. Meanwhile, gravity depends on mass, how much stuff is being attracted. And that, for this example, depends on how tall the column of liquid is. The taller the column of the liquid is, the more mass it has, and the greater the force of gravity acting on it. So to start with, when the column is really tall, gravity is winning. The liquid starts to flow out of the tube. But as the liquid flows out of the tube, there's less mass. And so the force of gravity becomes less as the liquid flows out which means while the atmosphere is pushing up steadily, the force of gravity is getting constantly weaker until, until we reach a balance, until the force of gravity trying to pull the liquid out is exactly balanced by the force of the atmosphere trying to stuff it back in. And we end up with a column of liquid standing in the glass tube. The greater the force of the atmosphere, the taller the column. The less the force of the atmosphere, the less height on the column. And so you can use the height of the column as a measure of how much pressure the atmosphere is exerting. And so that brings us to the point. What's the third thing they tell you in a weather forecast? The first thing they tell you is whether it's raining or not. The second thing they'd tell you is what the temperature is. And what's the third thing? The third thing they tell you is usually a number. And around here it's usually about 30. And what does that 30 represent? What that 30 represents is the height of a column of mercury that the atmosphere is presently holding up. They talk about the barometric pressure. And while you could, in theory, use any liquid in your barometer, the less dense the liquid is, the taller the thermometer is. Barometer is. And therefore, they use mercury because mercury is a very dense liquid. And as a result, you get a very short column in the barometer. One atmosphere, the atmosphere of the, the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level will hold up a column of mercury 760 millimeters high. Well, millimeters isn't pressure. Millimeters is height. And so we don't usually talk about millimeters of mercury itself. We usually talk about tor. Tor is the pressure exerted by a column of mercury one millimeter high. So one atmosphere is equal to 760 torr of pressure. In the SI units, the official SI unit for pressure is the Pascal. And so in official units, the pressure of the atmosphere is equal to 101.3 kilopascals of pressure. And that is a set of constants I expect you to know. I expect you to know what one atmosphere pressure is in tor and in kilopascals.
one atmosphere is 760 torr is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. And that brings us to the end of our first lecture on Chapter 13, Dealing with Gas Laws. Don't forget to turn in the homework, and have a nice day.